welcome back to the channel. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Sister Cece for sharing this story with me. This is one of those, again, that is a very important topic to discuss because what happened to this family happened to a lot of so-called black families in this country. It happened to a lot. Now, this was done on a state level. Okay, this is a black family that says California took their land decades ago. So this was done by the government, right? But there are situations where uh, black families lost their land um, in a violent way by just ordinary white citizens. So regardless to how it happened, it is still an American tragedy that needs to be talked about. So anyway, there is a very extensive report on this that's going to talk about this particular family and about the land that they no longer have ownership of because the state of California took it. Um, the church that you see on the screen there, uh, that church ties them to their family's legacy of owning that land. Um, of course, they have a lot more documentation as well in which the report is going to get into that. So I want you to take a listen at this report again. It's very um, extensive. Um, it gives all the details needed uh, to help you understand this story. Um, after listening to the report, I will definitely be right back. On a quiet, tree-lined road off Highway 49 in the gold rush town of Coloma sits a small, dilapidated white church. For some, it might go unnoticed. But for Jonathan Burgess, he says the humble wooden church represents his family's legacy. Burgess says his great-great-grandfather first came to California from New Orleans in 1849, initially brought as a slave to mine for gold. But he says he eventually was able to purchase his freedom, send for other family members and buy some acres of land to farm, as well as the church. Burgess has copies of newspaper clippings that refer to it as the first African-American Methodist church in Coloma. Today, he and his family claim that the church, along with a portion of land that is now within the Marshall Gold Discovery State Historic Park, once belonged to them and was unfairly taken away by the state. Newspaper clippings confirm this turnover of the land in 1947. As a kid, he remembers visiting. An older uncle, that was my grandfather's uncle who could no longer talk, he would just point and cry, Burgess said. Now as an adult, piecing this history together, I get why he was crying, all the land that our family once owned. The state and lawmakers have yet to address the Burgess family claims, so they remain disputed. But California is trying to confront its racist history, in particular policies that have discriminated against African Americans and black residents. A law passed in 2020 created a state reparations committee, which has convened to study and determine how the state might make amends. Part of the reparations discussion has centered on the subject of returning land that was taken from black and African American residents. It's an issue making headlines this year, in Los Angeles, the state returned a stretch of coastline property called Bruce's Beach this summer to the original African American family that owned the property after it was taken decades ago via eminent domain and the family was pushed out of the community. Burgess didn't fully become interested in looking into his family's history in Coloma until 2018, when a group reached out to him regarding the restoration of the African American church. He said this prompted him to start researching more into his family's history, where he then found his grandfather's name on the deed for the church in 1877. The people that live here today had nothing to do with the wrongs that were done, Burgess said, referencing the homes near his family's former church and orchards. So the last thing that I would say is uprooting them out of their homes regardless of whose land it is. But in the instances where the state owns the land, those lands should be returned to the rightful owners. Some kind of racist formula. Eminent domain is one of the primary ways states, counties and cities in California are able to take land from private owners. Governments often seize land saying it was needed for the creation of highways, roads or public parks. The government would pay families for the land. But Jovan Scott Lewis, a professor of geography at UC Berkeley and member of the state's reparations task force, said that the land transactions were often unfairly skewed to benefit governments. Historically, when we return to the question of African-American communities, there was always the possibility and, in fact, 
the actual occurrence of some kind of racist formula being used to undervalue the land that African Americans held when eminent domain was being exercised, Lewis said. He says this was central to the creation of California, especially in the post-war decades of the 1940s and 1950s. Within the state itself, you still have a need to develop in largely already populated places, Lewis said. And so the only way that you can do that is through the removal of people of communities, of landholders who, to put it bluntly, are in the way. For families like the Burgess family in Coloma, it's about more than just their claims of lost land, Lewis added. The impact is the disposition of capital. It is the interruption of intergenerational wealth, because land value tends to increase over the years and decades, Lewis said. What you have is also an interruption to the stability of community development. Forced to run into poverty. Kayvon Ward founded Justice for Bruce's Beach and co-founded Where Is My Land, an organization working to help African-American families reclaim property taken from them. Her organization was also integral in advocating for the return of Bruce's Beach in Manhattan Beach to the Bruce family. You have folks in this country telling black people to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. And when they do, the boots are taken, the laces are taken, the socks are taken. And black people are forced to run into poverty because their opportunity depends on generational wealth, Ward said. Ward formed her organization in 2020 after George Floyd's death. She was involved in a number of demonstrations calling for justice and an end to police brutality. And it was around this time that she learned about the history of Bruce's Beach. She created a petition to have the land returned to the family, and to her surprise it picked up steam. Eventually, it became a catalyst for a state law, and the land was returned last month. She's proud, but she does not expect the same path for other families. So many people are expecting for Bruce's Beach to be the blueprint. But what people don't understand is that the alignment was there, the right people in the state assembly, the right people in the state senate. This happened at the right time. I was there at the right time. This movement developed at the right time, Ward said. Since, her organization has taken on investigating five other cases across the state. She said she's hopeful for the Burgess family. A $350,000 national policy. Some experts say returning land is nowhere near enough to be called reparations. William Darity, a public policy and African-American studies professor at Duke University, is one of the nation's foremost experts on reparations. He said that the United States will have to extend beyond land and beyond California. I don't think that the state of California in isolation can actually meet the full terms of what's required for reparative justice, Darity said. But the state of California certainly can address historic wrongs that have been committed there and reverse policies and practices that continue to damage the lives of its black citizens. Finding exact documentation and quantification of what the United States government has taken from African Americans can be difficult, Darity says, so reparations in the form of closing the racial wealth gap is the most effective step forward. If we want to find an indicator that tells us something about what has happened with respect to the economic status of black Americans, the wealth gap is probably the most useful indicator of the cumulative intergenerational effects of American white supremacy, Darity said. He suggested a national policy that would give about $350,000 in a lump sum to each African American who is eligible who can show harm from government policy. This would be to account for loss of income as a result of discrimination, unfair housing policies, and land and property stolen. He acknowledges, however, that getting the United States government to make this wholesale change which would be the only path toward true reparations, he argues might not happen in his lifetime. A lot of people remain convinced that the reason we have this racial wealth gap is the fault of black people themselves, Darity said, adding that a national reparations program would require a shift in the way Americans think about economic justice. We're not asking for something for nothing. Burgess says he will continue to spread the message about his great-great-grandfather's land in the hopes that he can influence policy at the county or state level and trigger its return. He also hopes to rebuild the African-American church. We're not asking for something for nothing. Our family, to be here in 1849, 1850, had established so much, Burgess said. He said when he thinks about how much his family has lost since then, it's hurtful. In the case of Bruce's Beach in Los Angeles, 
the Bruce family was able to demonstrate legal ownership of the land. But there were restrictions on it that prevented return of ownership without a new state law. This past September, government. Gavin Newsom signed Senate Bill 796, which allowed for the state to give land back to the Bruce family. The Burgess family hopes that through advocacy about their family's history in Coloma, they can show their ownership of land in Coloma and encourage lawmakers to push for similar action. So far, the family has contacted a law firm to help them gather documentation for their case and testified in front of the state's reparations committee. Over the next two years, that group will put forward a report suggesting ways in which the state might take reparative action. Okay, so now that you heard the details, now that you've heard the details of what happened to this family, um, you can understand why it's, a very, it's very important that we talk about these things because this is not the only family that this has happened to. It's happened to so, so many, okay? Um, it, was, it was talked about in the article that even when they did compensate for land, it was always, you know, just kind of like, a, what do you call it, a lowball um, offer given to those who own land if you were black. They would give you a lowball offer. Now, no one is saying that this hasn't happened to others too. We're talking about our story because there are those who want to pretend like our story does not exist or that it doesn't matter. So we're talking about black stories as well because you know, many get their voice, their, their voices get heard, you know, and many times they are compensated quite differently than so-called black people. And so as often as we can, we need to um, voice these things. So it is known that, you know, not every black person was just sitting around waiting for the government to give them an, a handout. Uh, many times the government was taking from black people. And as I mentioned before, even average white citizens were taking land um, from black citizens violently. But no one wants to talk about that. Why don't you want to talk about it? It happened. It happened. Why not talk about it? It's the truth, right? And so this family, they are trying to get this land back. And I understand uh, they were even gracious enough to say that they know that there are people who had nothing to do with this stuff that the land was taken, you know, that the land was given to or have the land. And so basically what they're saying, if, if the state or the government still owns the land, they do believe that the government should give that land back. And even in cases where someone has inherited stolen land, where a family was brutally killed and it was taken from them, even in cases like that, uh, we had a viewer who actually suggested that even in cases like that, that the government should step in and compensate those families whose land was taken from them in a violent way. And I think I do agree with that because, you know, a lot of time goes by and, you know, other people set up legacies on the, on those lands and things happen. And I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about in a situation where a family has passed it down from generation to generation and they know that great, great, great granddad did something heinous to someone to get the land. As I stated before, I wouldn't want to have nothing to do with some land like that, right? So in certain situations, I think the person should, you know, uh, write that wrong. I think you should write that wrong because it would be expected of us to write that wrong. But in certain cases, certain other cases, I do believe that the government should intervene and compensate the descendants of those who had ancestors who were brutally murdered and their land taken from them. I think that's only fair. Since our government allowed policies to be in place that empowered these people to feel that they can do this stuff in the first place. You literally had governments who would look the other way knowing that this terrorizing of so-called black people was taking place. And since we had a government that was that lax against people who were doing this type of brutality against so-called black people, I think the government should compensate. I agree with the viewer who stated that. So um, anyway, um, I wanted to share this family story and the fact that this has happened all over this country and you know, it's, it's not fair. And for those of you who always like to say black people need to learn how to pull themselves up by the, their bootstraps, their bootstraps, these are people who not, who are not looking at 
history. They're not looking at the privilege that was granted to them, the fact that they were able to get loans that black people were denied of. We've talked about um, how we, we know of cases in talking to professionals when we lived in Michigan. Uh, we've, we've had white people who uh, we considered friends of ours uh, who would tell us different things that they know to be true in the industry. They said because of my ethnic name, I would have more difficulty getting a loan than my husband would or a mortgage. And, and that was absolutely right. When we were in real estate investing, that panned out to be true. Um, this white man also uh, stated to us, we had, an, I'm sorry, another white man stated to us that they had customers who they would do appraisals for who had horrible credit, okay? They would get them appraisals and get them loans even though their credit was horrible and they would get the best of rates. And because we, we would get into conversation about the interest rates that we were paying. Um, I remember one of our white neighbors up in Michigan when we told him our interest rate on our house right across the street from him where we lived, he and his wife, they were just, they were blown away. They were like, oh my God, I can't believe you guys are paying that much. So there are people who know that things aren't fair, but of course, nobody's going to stick their head out or stick their neck out, should I say, and try to do anything about it. And so when you tell black people to pull themselves up by their bootstraps, walk in our shoes for a day or two before you make that statement, okay? Because trust and believe when we tell you, nobody else needs to tell you, we're telling you our own experience. But unfortunately, many won't believe it until it comes out of the mouth of another white person, right? But trust us when we tell you or trust that white person when they tell you that things are not fair and that the playing field is not level. And unfortunately, many don't want a level playing field. They don't want things to be fair. They love the privilege that they have. And that is a very sad, unrighteous individual or group of people who feel that way. Mm, mm, mm. Anyway, I'm done with this video. Uh, before I close it out however I wanted to again draw that biblical link that biblical connection to this type of persecution it was talked about it was spoken about it was prophesied and it is real this is what the Bible says the tribe of Judah was going to have to deal with and let me draw another biblical connection so you all can understand that I'm not always talking about the punishment aspect coming from so-called white people Okay, but I want to talk about the punishment aspect coming from our creator as well, the Most High. The tribe of Judah had an issue with how we dealt with one another back in the day. Um, even usury. Usury is when you tack on all this interest when you lend to your brothers, right? That same usury that we put on our brothers and sisters back in the day, the Most High says, this is how you're going to be dealt with too. So a lot of what you see happen happening in the so-called black community is a reaping of what you have sown. Um, but these willing participants who are willing to be the judgment or the hand or the, the arm of Yah in this, um, in terms of the punishment, uh, they have to reap what they have sown as well. The Bible talks about this. Because they were willing to participants, the Most High uses who, whom he will, but he uses a willing heart. People have to be willing to do wickedness, you see. And I know it's really tripped out to hear this. We did a lesson um, this past Shabbat where we were talking about the power of, um, let me go to that, that message again. It's very interesting because when people don't understand why things are happening, they get kind of confused, right? They get kind of confused. But once you understand, um, then you can get past it and try to fix things. But the power within the decree, uh, there were decrees set a long time ago. Um, and so, hey, hey <laughs> it is what it is family we are doing what we must to educate our people on these things um, hopefully you will get it and you will understand that the things that we go through um, we are being you know chastised <laughs> in a sense or judged for the sins of our forefathers so it's come back around you see uh, our, our people are being judged for that but also the people who are willing to inflict these um, these judgments on us at the hands of the Most High Yah, they will be judged as well. That's just the way it works. You see the power of the decree. Anyway, I am done with this video. In the comment section below, remember to keep it tight and keep it right, but until next time.
be sure to ring the bell to be notified of new uploads on this channel and also comment, share, like, and subscribe.